Would you please? Philippians is where I need you to go with me this morning. Philippians chapter 3. Uh, thinking about some of this music we've had together, it's a crazy thing. I'm, uh, I'm at the age and stage, you know, ladies, you know this, some of you, uh, before you got married, you were thinking about songs you, and music you wanted in your wedding, and uh, if you're not married, you're probably thinking about some of that music you want to have. I'm at the age where I'm planning my funeral. I, I, uh, I got songs that I want in my funeral, and uh, it sounds morbid, but I, I really, really, I, I, I think about... Uh, <laughs> I think about the songs we've had together today. All I have is Christ. Jesus, I am resting, resting. Would you come to my funeral and sing in my funeral? Not planning on it anytime soon here, but uh, need, need that. Have I given you enough time to find Philippians 3? I guess I ought to find it too. I, I'm up here jawing away and I need to get into it here with you. You know, this particular letter written by the human author Paul, was guided by the Holy Spirit to convey this message in this particular letter, written to the church at Philippi, obviously. It's, it's a book, it's a letter in which Paul declares his testimony. Now there's many other things in, well, I shouldn't say many, there's, there are other truths that are found in this letter. Most of you would know this that Paul is writing to his friends in Philippi and he's telling them, he's saying to them, you know, what happened to you? You've lost the joy of the Lord. He tells them 17 times to rejoice. In this brief little letter, I can hold in two, two pages the entire letter in my Bible. It's a brief letter. He tells them 17 times to rejoice, to have joy. I remember as a little kid going to church, and I used to see people, you know, we have heard the joyful sound. Jesus says, Jesus says. Now, I don't know what they were going through, but as a kid, I'd look at them and I'd go, really? <laughs> now, we're not called to be goofy. We're not called to be silly, but there ought to be an internal Peace, rest, and joy, regardless of what's external around you. I don't want to dwell on this, but three years ago I heard from the doctor that I had cancer. I was standing at the threshold of the end of my days. Maybe that's why I think about funeral stuff. And only by His grace, I was able to keep my joy. And I found truths in Scripture and I found truth in His presence that I've clung to and anchored my life in. I just got to see my doctor just, just two days ago for my annual checkup. He says, three years and counting, you're doing good. He said, hang in there, don't, don't let it come back. I said, I'm not planning on it. I didn't want it the first time. But I'm going to tell you something, I thank God I got cancer. That sounds odd, but I thank God I went through it. Because of what I learned. And Paul is declaring a testimony in his own life. In fact, you're in chapter 3. It won't be hard. Look back at chapter 1. The Lord showed me this early on in those days. Look at verse 12. Oh, I wish I could just show you so many other things here in this first chapter. But look at verse 12. He says, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. You see, they had, they had sent a letter and a gift to him, and they said, they said, Paul, we're so sorry you're in prison. And he goes, oh, he said, I thank God for you. I thank God for every, upon every remembrance of you. I'm so grateful for you. But then he said, now look, he says, I want you to know the things which happened unto me. Could you say that you've had things happen unto you? Well, Sure. Is that my stomach? I, 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 I mean, is, it, is it time to go eat here? I, I'm hearing some growling here. Don't, don't start thinking about food right now, would you please? <laughs> Paul said, the things which happened unto me, he says, now look, he says, don't worry about me. He says, the things which happened to me have happened for the furtherance of the gospel. Amen. He says, I may be in jail, I may be in this Roman cell, but he says, I'm just 
I'm just witnessing to everyone of Caesar's household. I'm just knocking them off. You know, he's, I'm, I got these people that are tied to me. They can't go anywhere. So I'm, I'm telling them about Jesus. You just couldn't slow Paul down. Look at verse 21 of chapter 1. He said, for to me to live, well, he says, that's Christ. Hey, and to die, boom, that's gain. You, could, you couldn't stop him. They said, we're going to kill you, Paul. Great. <laughs> to die's gain. Oh, okay. And we're going to imprison you. Good. Bring on those soldiers. Let me witness to them. I mean, they just couldn't discourage him. And then we come to chapter 3, which is where I wanted you to go. And Paul is giving a personal testimony. Look at verse 3. He says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect or complete, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we'll stop right there. You know, folks, I'm telling you, I could give all kinds of testimony up here about people who could, uh, who their very life would line up in many ways the, what, the way Paul just described his life. Testimonies of others. You say, what do you mean? People who have changed and they've never been the same. There's only one person who can do that in my life or in yours, and that's the Lord Jesus. He's the only one who creates change in people's lives. There was a girl in one of my youth ministries a few years ago. You talk about rebellious. Man, she was, she was hateful. I mean, she was, uh, she was just full of hateful bitterness. It was incredible. And the first time I was preaching to the youth group and, and everything, I, was, I had this room full of teenagers, and I spotted her. She was sitting back in the back, and she did everything she could not to pay attention. She messed with her fingernails, and she messed with her purse, and she talked to people all around her and everything. And uh, I could just see by her mannerism, and she, I hate this stuff. I just don't want it. So being who I am when the service is over with, I just kind of meandered my way back there toward her, and I, I, uh, I was talking to other kids and so forth, made my way back there, and I said, hey, how are you? What's your name? I got her name, and I said, hey, well, Deb, I said, uh, I said I'm sure... Sir, glad you're here and in the youth group and everything. I said, I'm glad to be uh, here being able to preach to you. And I said, I see you, you had a little bit of a trouble paying attention. And she kind of gave me that. Ladies, don't get mad at me, okay? I mean, it was sort, this, sort of this feminine, <laughs> whatever spirit. Now, guys can get it too, but they're kind of, they're a little bit different in their de demeanor. But I mean, she was, she was just... <laughs> You know, and I said, well, look, I said, I, I said, you may not be interested, but people around you may be interested. I said, in the future, can I said, can you give me a little better uh, uh, hearing? And I said, just, and she said, well, I don't know. I just don't know. Well, next time, she was the same way. 
and I began to make my way after the service <laughs> over there toward her again. This time I saw her coming toward me a little bit. It was like she was saying, you know, bring it. You want to talk about it? <laughs> but it was, it was, it was, she enjoyed the, the, uh, the banter. And I could tell she wanted to let me know she was not interested, but she was interested in letting me know she was not interested. So I felt like we had taken a small step. Third time, it would improve a little better. After about the fourth time, I, she met me halfway down the aisle. She came to me. And, and I could tell little by little she was uh, uh, breaking down. But when I'm telling you this, it went on for months. It went on for months. It was her senior year, early in the year, she attended our Christian school. We happen to have a Christian school at my church as well. I had just gotten home, and uh, I was, uh, I had put on some, uh, uh, some relaxing shorts, and I had uh, sat in my recliner, and I probably had a plate of nachos sitting right there in front of me, you know, and turned on ESPN when my phone rang, and I was said, uh, they called me Pastor G. They said, pa someone called me and said, Pastor G, you know we're having a school uh, retreat over our Christian school. We're having a little gathering uh, of the retreat. And I said, yeah. I said, how's it going? They said, well, we need you to come. And, I, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, nachos. I said, well, uh, well uh, what? And I said, what? And, she, and the lady teacher said, well, you know, Deb, uh, she wants to get saved. Oh, I said, that's wonderful. I said, well, lead her to the Lord. They said, we've tried. <laughs> but she wants you here for it. I said, she doesn't need me to be there. We told her that. But she wants you here. I said, all right, I, I'll be there as soon as I can. So back on with the 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 garments of ministry, and I, uh, I drove over to this camp about 45 minutes away, and I, I walked in, and there she sat at a table with one of the teachers, and she was smiling, looking up at me like, what took you so long? And I, I looked at her, and I said, what, what are you doing? And she said, I want to get saved. I said, well, good. I said, why haven't you already taken care of it? These folks are trying to help you. She said, I know, but you and I have talked so many times, I just wanted you to be here for it. I said, okay, all right. So I showed her the gospel that she knew well, and with tears in her eyes, she accepted Christ as her Savior. Can I tell you something? Prior to that time, I had found out what had caused her such disgust and anger and bitterness was directed at her parents, in particular her mother. She despised her mother for decisions her mother had made and family had made. They had actually moved to get her, Deb, away from some of the wrong element that she used to be a part of. And she had determined, I will never forgive my mother for what she had done. And so whenever I stood to preach, I represented that authority and she was furious until that night. Can I tell you, every time we came to church from that point on, I watched her walk in the door. Ready? Ready? arm in arm with her mother. She loved her mom. She'd sit in church and she'd sit there and she'd smile at her mom. They loved each other as close as they could be. I saw that girl begin to feast on the Word of God and change dramatically. I'm just telling you. It was about, I don't know, four or so years. I, I, had left, I left the church and went into the itinerant evangelistic work that I do now and and uh, I was uh, living in Indiana at the time and away from that ministry. And I get a phone call. This girl had gone off to Christian college, smart girl, just brilliant girl, passed with highest of honors. And uh, she uh, she had gotten her degree. And she calls me. She goes, Pastor G, she said, I'm getting married. I said, Deb, that's wonderful. Tell me who you married. She told me it was a guy that was a part of the, the church I used to be a part of. I said, oh, he is a great guy. I said, that's wonderful. She said, yeah, we want you to marry us. I said, uh, Deb, I don't live there anymore. You know that. And I said, and I, I, I said, my schedule uh, won't, won't allow. I said, she goes, no, we want you to marry us, and we're going, we want you to do it. I said, well, when are you getting married? She said, when can you get here? I said, I, I said no, 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 no. When are you, what are you shooting for? She said, well, we'd like to early, early summer, but we'll arrange it anytime your schedule goes. I said, what is the date you're looking for? She gave me a date in June. 
I said, look, Deb, I said, I, there's no way. I said, I, I don't think I, I grabbed my calendar. And I looked at it, and I looked at that weekend, and I said, oh, would you look at that? <laughs> I said, okay, I've got that Saturday free. I said, I'm in between youth camps. I can come and, I, yeah, I can do it. Good. She said, I knew it would work out. Can I tell you something? It is the only wedding I have ever conducted in which, which I, I, while I'm doing it, of course, I got a microphone on me, and so I had to whisper it, but in, she, she was giddy with delight. She was so happy about getting married. She was so happy in the Lord, joyful in the Lord, that I literally had to say, be still. She was just bouncing up there. And, and I was looking at everybody behind her. Everybody was laughing and pointing at her because she was just giddy. And I thought, no one's listening uh, to the message and what we're doing here. So I had to say, calm down, would you please? What did I see in that girl? She changed from hateful anger, bitterness to this delightful individual. Oh, I could talk about the boy who got saved this last summer uh, at a camp. He got saved, and I'm telling you something, he cried after every service. 16 years of age, came up and would ask me, where are those verses you preach from? And I'd show him, brand new Christian, brand new believer, was unfamiliar with the Bible, weeping. And he says, I've never heard this stuff before. And he had changed. I could talk about the kid who ran away from home three times, and then God saved him and now he's pastoring his church in Tennessee today. I could talk about a number of people who have changed. Paul is writing to us here in Philippians 3 of how God changed him. And I have to draw the que I have to ask you this question. Are you being changed? Oh, you say, Morris, I got, I got changed when I got saved. Yeah, I know that. But here's the deal. There is the change that takes place when we come to Christ, we call that a positional change. Friends, someday when we get to heaven, there will be what we call the perfected change. All will be clean and clear and right and no more battling with the flesh. Won't that be wonderful? There is the positional change in Christ. There will be the perfected change. But between here and heaven, folks, hear me, there is to be a progressive change. Jesus is still in the process of equipping us and progressing us in change. And that's what Paul's talking about. Paul divides his testimony. In fact, every testimony has three parts to it, and I'll say it as quickly as I can. The section before Christ, B.C., then how I came to Christ, then how I live after I came to Christ. Look at what he said about his time before Christ. Would you notice... Please, in verse 4, he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, in my human body, if any other man thinketh that he has whereof, to uh, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now look at this. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day. In other words, he says, I had the right beginning. He said, my orthodox parents took me to a temple or the synagogue as a little Jewish boy, and I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's exactly according to Moses' law. He said, he said, I had the right beginning. And not only the right beginning, he said, I had the right nationality. Look at, again at verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. He was saying, I'm a blue blood man. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true, altogether Israelite. He said, I had the right nationality. He said, not only that, he said, I came from the right tribe. Look, he says, I came from the, the, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now you say, now Morris, what's the big deal about being from the tribe of Benjamin? There were two tribes that stayed with the Davidic kingdom, the kingdom of David, and that was the kingdom of Judah and Benjamin. More importantly, the tribe of Benjamin, the section of Benjamin in Israel was where Jerusalem was located. <laughs> you see what Paul say? He said, I had the right beginning. I had the right nationality. I had the right tribe. Then he says, I had the right training. He says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He said, I got a Christian education, man. I was, I was educated in Christian theology. I had homeschooling. I had the Christian institution of education. He said, I was given curriculum that was Bible-based. He says, look, man, I was altogether trained 
according. He goes, my whole life of history, I had the right training. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And not only that, he said, I had the right energy. He says, I, he said, uh, concerning the law, I was a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He said, man, he goes, I was not sitting in the stands as a follower of religion. Don't, don't miss this. He was saying, I was not a guy on the sideline. He said, man, I was in the game. I was, I was shedding blood for this thing, and I was making sure that others would shed their blood. He said, I was zealous in my religion. And he said, and I had the right morality. Look at the end of that, that, that verse, uh, verse 6. He said, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, you couldn't find anything wrong about me. He said, I had everything in the world. He said, I was, I was right in every category. Right training, right heritage, uh, right, right uh, beginning. I had the right zeal, the right energy, the right morality. I was, I was sincere about it all. The only problem is he was sincerely wrong. Now, folks, I may be looking at someone here this morning. You've had religion in your life your whole life. You, you grew up in a family where a family Bible sat on a, on a coffee table. You had sacred works of art in the house. You've attended church all, your, all through the years. You, uh, your dad uh, uh, was a deacon. Your mom taught Sunday school. Your grandmother and grandfather are buried in the church uh, uh, cemetery. Do you have one? You don't have one out there. Uh, you know, uh, you say, I, I mean, I mean, I got a heritage that is as deep as it can be. I'm telling you, I had uncles that were preachers and I had, okay, fine. I want to tell you something, dear friend, you mark it down. Paul was saying, I had a lot I could brag about, but he said that was before Christ came into my life. When I realized I was, I was outside of him. A man came forward in one of our church services and he said, I've been going to church all my life. And he says, I've been, I've been acting like everything was set and settled. But he said, I got to be honest with you. He said, I have never bowed the knee before the Lord Jesus and said, save me. Come into my life and save me. He said, I've trusted my religion, my family, my history. And he said, but today I want to accept Christ. They sent me a picture just two weeks ago of him getting baptized at church. Thank God for that. A teenage girl came up one day and she said, Mister, all of my life I've been told that if I'll be real good, God will take me to heaven. She says, I've heard that all my life. All of my life. I said, how old are you? I'm 16. Ooh, that's a long time. I said, 16 years you've been. She goes, I, she goes I'm a good student. I'm a good daughter. My mother tells me I'm a good daughter. And she said, all of my life I've been told that I was good. And she said, but you tonight said we could never be good enough on our own to get to God. I said, you heard correctly. And I thought we were through talking and I was burdened about where this was going. But her cousin standing right next to her said, well, well, well tell him the rest. So she said, tonight I, I stepped out and a lady showed me from the Bible what you were saying. She said, and I asked Jesus to save me. She said, now I know I'm going to heaven. And it's not on me. It was all on him. Paul was saying, I had all these good things going, but I was not right with God. B.C. Then, when he came to Christ. How did he come to Christ? Well, if you just simply see his testimony in verse 7. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. And I do count them but dung, rubbish, refuse, that I may win Christ. In other words, Paul was saying, I took a look at my ledger. And I took a look at my ledger at all the the wealth of goodness in my life. And he says, and I looked at it and I said, I'm bankrupt. None of this is worthy of getting me into heaven. And the truth is, he says, I, I, I'm in rags. But he says, I come to Jesus and I find that everything I've been looking for has been found in him. 
And that's true for you and that's true for me if you know Jesus. And if you don't know, if you just know about him, friends, let me tell you something. Everything you're looking for on planet earth is found in Jesus Christ. Swallow your pride and admit it this morning. Don't worry about this person or that person or this person or anybody else. Recognize I don't have Jesus Christ in my life. Paul saw that. One of my uh, uh, fancies of, of the years of growing up when I did was this guy that was way ahead of his time in the world of basketball. And some people may not even be familiar with his name anymore. He had a nickname. He was called the Pistol. Pistol Pete Maravich. Pete Maravich could do things with a basketball nobody else was doing. Nobody even thought about doing it. He, he threw the no-look pass when nobody was doing it. He could dribble around anything and everything. He shot like a crazy man. I mean, he played over there at LSU in Louisiana. I'm going to tell you something. His records stand in the NCAA record books to this day. He averaged 44.7 points a game. Incredible. People, people would pack out the, the gymnasiums and the, and the field houses to watch him put on a show. He would go to some other college campus and they were there to ho hopefully beat Pete Maravich and the LSU Tigers. But by the end of the game, there were more people cheering for him than they were for their own team because of the things he could do. He was phenomenal. Pete Maravich in his own testimony, I've heard it, would tell that he had a lot of things going for him, but he was not happy. He said, I was successful in sports, but he said, I wasn't happy. He said, I, uh, he, said he, took up, uh, uh, he took up martial arts, thinking that maybe, maybe if I can find some way to meditate, sit and meditate, and take up martial arts and so forth, which is fine. He said, it would, it would do something. It would fill the void inside of me. He said, it didn't. He said, I, I decided to become a vegetarian. And uh, he goes, now, now, if you eat carefully like that, fine. But he, he, Pete said in his own words, he said, it left me empty in more ways than one. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, he, then he started studying UFOs. And he said, uh, he started believing that there was other life on other places in other galaxies. And he actually got on the roof of his house and painted the words, take me. He was hoping some alien would take him away. He was looking for happiness. He said he never went anywhere without about $8,000 in his, in his wallet, probably like many of you. And, uh, and, and he said, because you never knew when I might want to just jump on a plane and fly somewhere. He said, I had all the money in the world. I chased women. He said, I tried drugs. He said, I was popular. He said, nothing satisfied me until I was sitting in a conference for young people, and he said, they asked me to come and put on a display of basketball skills. He said, I sat in the back, and he said, I heard about Jesus for the first time. Soon thereafter, Pete bowed his heart to the Lord, and he said, Jesus, come into my life and save me. And he was changed. Pete never went anywhere without taking gospel tracts with him, never, from that point on. His family said that he would go play in some other uh, city on, on a basketball, on you know, one of the NBA teams. And, and in between practice and ball games, he'd walk the streets of that city and he'd pass out gospel tracts. Well, who's going to say no to this famous NBA player? He would take gospel tracts and hand it out. He, he got to where if he had a Sunday free, he'd go and stand and he'd give his testimony of how Christ came into his life and changed him. My friend, can I tell you something? Paul is declaring to us here what he was before Christ, how he came to Christ, but it didn't stop then. Many of you could say, that's my testimony. All right, now listen carefully. What are you doing now? Is there an ongoing change? Hear me, that's visible. It's obvious. It's verbal. It's vibrant. It's recognizable. Something, you ever seen somebody on crutches and got their arm in the swing or something? What, what's the first words out of your mouth when you see your friend? Oh, man, what happened to you? Are you the kind of Christian that somebody can look at your life and say, and someone say, what's happening to you? Paul declares the changes in his life. Would you notice, please, 
in verse, in verse uh, 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. He says, he changed me, man. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him. Paul said here, I have a new priority. He says, the change that's taking place in my life is that I have a new priority in my life. What is it, Paul? That I may know him. You say, Morris, I, I know the Lord. Look at me. Paul, when he wrote these words, had been a believer in Jesus Christ. Are you ready for this? For 30 years, probably a little over 30 years. And what's he saying is his priority in life? I, I, I still, I'm still trying to get to know him better. I want to know him. I want to know him better. We sing it more, more about Jesus. You ever been around a new believer, a new convert who's gone through the process of this portion of the change? It's like every song sung is like, oh man, oh, that's, that's, that's another one of my favorite songs. They have 367 favorite songs. <laughs> and every time pastor preaches, they're going, What's he doing? Is he parking out in front of my house watching everything I do? Oh, pastor, I needed this sermon. They're the, one of the first ones there, one of the last ones to leave. They walk up with a handful, with a sheet of paper, say, Pastor, I have a few questions I need to ask you. I only, I only got a chance to read 300 chapters this week in the Bible. I mean, they're just feasting on it. The only thing I fear is that that new convert's going to get around somebody who's been saved for a long time, who's not pursuing a new priority, a powerful priority of knowing the Lord. Where, where are you in this? this? This this statement that Paul is saying, he's saying here boldly, I am in Christ, like the weaving of, of threads together to make material, like the weaving of twine to make a rope. He says, I am tied in with the Lord and I just want to know Him. Is that true of you? Or, or is your testimony one of, yeah, I know the Lord. Mm -hmm. And a preacher can say, take your Bible and turn to, you know, Hosea. I'm there. I know my Bible. Well, wonderful. I'm glad. And I'm being kind of cold in my description. But can I ask you honestly, ma'am, sir, young person, is this a priority with you? To hear His voice in the words of Scripture. To hear Him speak to you. I have a preacher friend who's now with his Lord who used to say this. He said, when I get to heaven and I audibly hear for the first time the voice of Jesus, I want to be able to say, I've heard that voice before. No, not audibly. But he's talked to me. I know him. I heard another man say, and this, of course, won't happen, but some people live in such a way that when they get to heaven, they, they're going to have to introduce themselves because they're not in touch with the Lord. You see, this change is supposed to be taking place. Paul says here, I, I just want to keep pursuing him and know him. When David stepped down off the throne of Israel and he was passing off the, the monarchy, the, the throne baton off to his son Solomon, listen to what he said. He said, and thou, my son Solomon, know thou the God of your father. If you seek him, he will be found of thee. Ezra spoke in chapter uh, 4. He said, he said, he goes, I, I set my heart to know his word, to do what he said, and then to teach others what he taught me. That's a paraphrase. That's not a direct quote. Ezra said, I have spent time pursuing him like a young couple in college or out of college, and they start dating each other. I mean, they want to get to know everything about each other. She looks at the curve of his ear. Like, that's important. <laughs> He's listening to her voice, and they just want to get to know each other. And they stand there at the marriage altar, and every husband 
that's getting married. He thinks he knows her. Oh, son. Son. It's a lifetime journey <laughs> to know your wife, to understand her thoughts, her feelings that sometimes she doesn't understand. <laughs> but your companions, Paul said, I just want to know him. Would it be true in your life that somebody walks around you and they can sense you're, you're continually being changed with this new priority of knowing him? Paul said, I, want, I have a new priority. But number two, he says, I have a new power. Look at verse 10 again. He says here that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Can I just touch this? And, but I want to make sure you get it. Paul said, I've been changed. I have heaven to look forward to, but I'm still going through the progressive change in my life. He goes, I have a new priority that I may know him. And he says, I have a new power. What is that? The power of his resurrection. Answer this question in your own heart. What could be, what could be more <laughs> powerful than resurrection? I mean, seriously. I mean, what could be more powerful than being brought from death to life? Paul says, I want to know that power, the power of his resurrection in my life. Okay, practical application. What does that mean? Would you not like to have power over temptation? Would you not, would you not like to have the kind of power that says no to that which has weakened you through the years and say, I'm not going to do that anymore? Wouldn't you like to have the power of a godly testimony in which when you interact with people at school and at work, and wherever it may be, there is a power that you don't, you don't conjure up yourself. You don't draw it up within your personality. You don't read books about it. It is a power that God alone gives to you. Paul says, I'm, I'm growing, I'm changing, and I want to know more about this power. A powerful prayer life. The kind of prayer life that allows me to talk to God and to know that not only he hears me, but if it be according to his will, he will answer according to his will. I'm having a powerful testimony, a powerful victorious life over temptation. Do you want that kind of power to overcome tests and trials that seem to take your breath away? And you think, I can't live with this, this burden. And yet you can say, I have a power that I didn't know I had. Where does that come from? It comes from a constant change that the Lord brings into your life, which leads me to the next statement. There is a new priority. There is a new power, and there's a new partnership. Look again at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and here it is, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Fellowship. I call it a partnership. Friends, let me tell you something. If the Lord came to, if he, if the Lord sent an angel to you and said, "I have scheduled, I have scheduled a real suffering, pain, I've, I've, I've scheduled a car accident, I've scheduled a doctor's report that you don't want to hear, I've scheduled a, a heartbreaking situation, I, I've scheduled all this uh, for tomorrow afternoon. Is that going to work with your schedule?" You say, you know, let me check that. Uh, no, can we reschedule that for about 300 years from now? I don't, I don't want that. We don't know. Hear me. Come up close to your Bible. We don't know when trouble's going to come. We don't know when something comes along that takes your breath away emotionally, spiritually. You don't know. I don't know. And I don't want it. But I said something a while ago. I thank God I got cancer. You say, why? Because I learned something about the partnership of his sufferings. I learned some things I didn't know prior to that time. I learned what it is to go through something and say, Lord Jesus, you know what I'm feeling. You know, God knows your loneliness. God, the Lord, the Lord knows your pain. The Lord knows your disappointments. The Lord knows your heartache. He knows. He went through it all. And there'll be a, there's a partnership that occurs that won't occur unless you're allowing him to strengthen and change you and 
make you more into His image. We don't want that, but He's shaping us and He knows how much we can handle. As hard as that is to accept, it is the truth. He allows, he allows trouble, He allows persecution to create Christ-likeness into our lives. He allows crises in our lives. Disciples in a boat being tossed around by a terrible storm scared them Scared, they thought they were going to die. Let me tell you something, they never forgot what Jesus did in their life. They never forgot it. Martha and Mary were heartbroken. Their, their brother Lazarus was dead. And yet they never forgot how Lazarus came out of that tomb. And I could go on and on. There is a change of partnership and I need to close. He said, not only do I have a new priority and a new power and a new partnership, he said, I have a new perspective. For sake of time, you know the verses here that we just read, verses 13 and 14. Paul said, he said, brethren, I haven't reached everything that I want to reach. There have been things that have pulled on my heart, things I want to do and things I want to be for the Lord. And I've not fulfilled everything that I'm supposed to fulfill for the Lord. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, which would include not only failures, but also victories. He says, he goes, I'm not going to live my life going down the road just checking out the rearview mirror. If you're on the way home today, if you're driving down the road, if all you do is look through the rearview mirror, you're going to have a wreck. It's okay to glance up there. It's important to remember to see where you've been, but you've got to keep your eyes on that big, broad uh, glass in front of you in the future. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, I have a whole new perspective. What is it, Paul? He says, one of these days I'm going to face the Lord. And he says, when I face him, in fact, let's look at it. He said, I'm keeping my eyes. He said, verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm keeping my eyes on eternity. I'm not going to live just for this day and be fulfilled to today. I'm going to make decisions today based upon keeping my eyes on eternity. Change that takes place in my life and in your life affects our view of life and the direction of our life. I know you've been patient. I appreciate it. Just stay with me for a couple more moments. Paul was saying, I am keeping my eyes on the future of seeing the Lord someday in heaven and hearing him say, well done. You did what I told you to do. You fulfilled what I gave you to fulfill. Paul was saying this. You could, you could agree with this, couldn't you? I haven't arrived yet. I haven't done everything I need to do yet. He was saying, I'm going to bury the past. I'm going to get God's forgiveness and not live with a bunch of guilt in my life. It's under the blood of Christ. I'm going to move on. And he says, I'm going to pursue forward like a runner toward the Lord. I'm accelerating forward to the finish line. When I was a kid, excuse me, when my boy was a small child, one night his mother told him, son, it's time to go get your room cleaned up and get ready for bed. And I don't know about your kids, but my boys didn't, never wanted to go to bed. Uh, and uh, isn't it amazing how it changes when you get older, you know? <laughs> you want to stay up till midnight when you're a kid. When you become an adult, 9.30 is looking real good. That pillow is looking good. Now, anyway, he didn't want to go to bed. He was just a little youngster. And uh, my, my wife said, Andy, get in there and clean up your room and get ready for bed. And he was in there, and he was dragging his feet, and he was putting a few things up in the toy chest and, and putting things where they belong and so forth. But he'd get occupied with something he played with earlier during the day and he was just messing around. I, I walked by his room. And I saw what he, he was not doing, what he was supposed to do. And I looked at him. I said, son, you've been told to get this room clean. You know, you know the eye that parents give? I said, let's get this room clean now. And he knew I better do what daddy says. And so all of a sudden, <laughs> things begin to go into the closet. You know, he's burying out of the thing. Oh, look, there's my little brother. You know, and I mean, he was, he was just finding all kinds of things. He was putting back up in the closet and, and so forth. And when he got everything in place, he came and found me. And he brought me down to his room. He said, Daddy, Daddy, come here. We walked down to his room. And he said, Daddy, 
look. You know, like a TV host on one of those game shows. It's a new car, you know. I mean, uh, he said, Daddy, look. Does this make you proud of me? How, how do you squeeze a little kid strong enough to let him know how proud you are, how pleased you are? I'm willing to squeeze him until his eyeballs poke bulged out for, because he obeyed his mom and his dad. I made a big deal out of it. We had time in scriptures. We had prayer. I put him into bed, and before long, he was, he was out. After a bit, I walked back down the hall, and I saw that he was asleep. I went over, and in the darkness of his room, I got on my knees. I gently put my hand on his body. I could feel the rise of his breathing. And in my heart, I prayed, Lord, my boy wanted his daddy to be proud of him. I said, Lord, I want to live in a way that you're proud and pleased with me too. You're my father. I want you to be pleased with me. Paul said, I got a new perspective. I'm being changed. Maybe for you this morning, it's a matter of just getting back to making a priority of getting to know God. Maybe it's understanding of the trials that you're going through and understanding the pain that you're going through. And I, when I say understand, I mean by that, you know that the Lord's doing His masterful work. Maybe there's something else that I didn't really specifically say, but the Spirit of God brought to your attention this morning. Maybe this morning you just need to say, God, help me to quit fretting over everything of this day and keep my perspective on facing you someday. I want the change to continue. Let's bow our heads for prayer. A visible, verbal, vibrant change. It starts with knowing Christ, being in Christ, the change that came at salvation. Is there someone here this morning that would say, Mr. Preacher, I've got to tell you, I'm just not real sure I'm going to heaven. I know some things about God. I know some things about heaven. I know some things I've heard the name Jesus. Maybe all your life, but you'd say, preacher man, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. But I want to go to heaven. I want, I want to have a relationship with God. And you'd say, Morris, pray for me. Just pray for me. I promise I won't embarrass you, but I'd like to know if you're concerned about that. And you'd say, pray for me because I want to know I'm going to heaven. All you got to do is lift your hand. I'll see it and you put it down. I will not point you out. Who here this morning would say, I don't know about people around me, but I, for one, I'm not sure that I have this initial change with Jesus as my Savior. Morris, pray for me. All you got to do is lift your hand. Anyone like that? I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I want a relationship with God. Morris, pray for me. Thank you, friend. I will pray for you. I sure will. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you. I want Jesus in my life, but just pray for me. I'll keep that promise in a minute and pray for these two. Who here this morning as a child of God would say, Morris, I heard something today that you preached on from Paul's testimony of how he was changed and never the same. And Morris, honestly, I, I want to live in such a way that people will begin to detect the, the ongoing progressive growth and change in me. I heard something today. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. But I heard something today I needed to hear, Morris. God spoke to me. Would you lift up your hand all over the room? God challenged me. He encouraged me about things today. Wonderful. Super. You may put your hands down. Would you stand with me? Let's stand. I know that this church understands what an invitation is all about. You understand what it means to have opportunity to talk to the Lord. There's 
one or two people who said, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, pray for me. I'm going to pray for them. In a moment, we're going to have our heads bowed. I, I would love to talk to you. If you want to talk after the service, please let us know that. If you'd rather talk to Pastor Will, please do so. And uh, that'd be great. If this morning, child of God, God spoke to you about something, about some change that needs to be ongoing in your life, he spoke to you, so you speak to him. You say, how do I do that? It's called prayer. If you want to get on your knees, talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I want this visible, vibrant change in me. Or sit right back down in your chair and lean over the seat in front of you and make that your altar. You do what you need to do today, would you? And let the Lord keep the change moving in your life. And say, Lord, I heard from you today. I want to make you a priority change. Father, thank you for these, my friends. I pray that you'll help each one of us together today to respond to you as we ought. I pray for two individuals who said, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. God, I pray that you'll give them the courage to ask for help before they leave today. And I pray for your people that you'll give them the confidence and the courage to respond to you as they should. We ask it in your wonderful name. Our heads are bowed. Would you find that place to seek the Lord as the music starts again? Would you find that place to spend some time? Just have a seat. Get on your knees. You do what you need to do right now across.